Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're totally delighted to be joined by one of the most interesting and respected leaders in higher education today, Dr. Ruth Simmons, who is the president of Prairie View A&M in Texas. Uh, Dr. Simmons has an amazing story. She grew up in Grapeland, Texas. Um, she was born there. She actually grew up in Houston. She attended uh, Dillard uh, College, uh, Dillard University in New Orleans, had an important uh, four years there. We'll talk about that. She went on to graduate work in, at Harvard, where she earned both a master's and PhD in languages. Um, and then her first academic position was as a professor of French at the University of New Orleans. Uh, she served later in an administrative capacity and then went on to serve in some really remarkable administrative positions at, at USC, at Princeton, um, but back at Princeton and also Spelman College. Um, and then in 1995, she was uh, selected to be the president of Smith College, an incredibly important university, had a very consequential tenure there. And then 2001 became president of Brown, uh, where she began about a decade of remarkable transformative leadership. Uh, she was the first African-American president of an Ivy League university. She retired in 2012. And then a few years later, she was lured out of retirement by uh, Prairie View a and first as an interim and then became president a few months later and is just doing some interesting and transformative work at the university. And we are delighted to meet with her today. Hello, Dr. Simmons. Hi, thank you. Please call me Ruth. Okay. Well, Ruth, when you talk, uh, when you tell your life story, the thing that's most striking um, is the way you compliment and you talk about both your parents and teachers. And I was watching a clip of your inaugural address at uh, Prairie View. And I want to read a couple sentences and maybe have you tell a bit more. You said, my mother and father lived most of their lives at the poverty level, raised 12 children to adulthood. They taught us how to live with dignity and purpose, insistent on showing us the basic respect that they were never afforded. My parents kept us safe at a dangerous time. Without their sacrifice and teaching, I could not stand here today. Tell us about your parents. Wow, that's uh, emotional for me. Well, um, I suppose in many ways, my uh, early life was quite unremarkable because it was the life of most African-Americans uh, in the South. Um, we lived, uh, my parents were sharecroppers, and so we had a farming life. And the wonderful thing about that, although it was very hard work uh, for both adults and children in that system, the wonderful thing about it is that families were together. Uh, and so I had uh, a large family. Uh, I was the youngest and we were together. Uh, and that meant that my mother and father uh, 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 were able to see us, to spend a lot of time with us, to uh, give us many exhortations about how to be decent human beings all day, every day. Um, and so on to give us incredible guidance. But when I say that, that um, they kept us safe, that was inordinately important because um, it, you know, people disappear, people were harmed. Uh, for being black in that in that era of the 40s and 50s, and so um, and so the fact that we all lived to adulthood was was one thing that we marveled at and and celebrated, uh, frankly. But to be to go beyond that and to really be decent human beings, uh, uh, not uh, angry, not resentful, uh, not um, uh, disrespectful of of anybody. What what a what an incredible thing that was for parents for parents to be able to guide us in that way in those difficult times and to have us come out um, as normal human beings. So, um, in addition, um, the work ethic that uh, they showed us was remarkable. And I suppose in those days, really, when you did field work um, and you were overseen. Uh, very uh, attentively to make sure that you brought in the proper uh, weight of cotton and so forth. Um, uh, of course, your survival depended on your producing exactly what uh, owners wanted you to produce. Um, 
But in addition to that, as you know, in sharecropping, you often had a little bit of room to do your own gardening, to your, do your own, um, uh, 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 do your own kind of entrepreneurial um, uh, work. And so uh, we watched our parents uh, do that and keep us, um, keep us safe and also uh, uh, nurtured in that way. And so what we developed as a consequence is a work ethic that mimicked that to a certain degree. And so the one thing that I recall about my mother is that when we moved to the city, um, she, she worked as a maid. And I used to think as a child, oh, what an unforgiving task it is to clean people's toilets and to iron their clothes uh, for very little money. And I, I, I just, I, I marveled at that. But in watching her do her work, I'm sure she knew that it was unforgiving. She knew that it was uh, demeaning work, but she never showed that. And she did it to a fairly well. So I often say that uh, when people ask me where I learned to do my work, I often say it was my mother, because watching her pay attention to ironing the way that she did uh, when she got very little reward for it uh, taught me a lot about human dignity and what um, care for your work uh, can do for your character. And so, uh, so I thank her for that. I think actually when you were uh, had just been named president of Smith, maybe, uh, and someone asked, you know, about the expectations of the board of trustees. And you said, I'm sure they're very high, but I'm more concerned about meeting my mother's standards than I am the board of trustees. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I still I still feel that way. Am I am I doing enough? Uh, even now, I ask myself that. Well, let's also talk about some teachers, and you've had some remarkable ones. And the one that kind of jumps out of your story is your, um, your unfortunately, your mother passed away when you were very young, and you had this wonderful high school drama teacher, Mrs. Lilly, I think was her name, yes. who just completely embraced you and kind of brought you into the world of of, of theater and, and just kind of saw the, the potential in you and just really invested herself in you. Tell us about Mrs. Lilly. I don't know how she saw it, frankly. We came from uh, the rural area uh, to, um, to a city and, and we were truly country bumpkins. And, uh, and so how teachers had the ability to see what we were capable of, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was very self-conscious um, at that time because I thought, you know, I don't have the right clothes. I don't, I don't speak properly, um, and so people must be laughing at me somehow. But you know, teachers are wonderful, aren't they? Uh, they can they can see into your future in a way that is amazing to me. And she did that for me. So um, so she had two children, um, and um, and she would often take me home uh, with her. Um, she'd take me to plays. Uh, she got me involved in debate. Um, and so I think I rather see that period uh, when she was helping me as kind of rounding out those rough edges, uh, because what's better than theater for doing that, right? <laughs> so, um, and so I acted, most people who knew me from high school would remember me as an actress in, in theater productions. Um, but it was more than just the theater productions, because of course, as you know, when you work in the theater, you do everything, you build sets, you um, the most important thing is you have to be a member of the team and you've got to do the work. And so being, uh, being a member of stage crafters at Wheatley High School in Houston was, uh, was excellent for me, but she did more than that. Um, she thought I should go to college. And I, I mean, how could I possibly conceive of that? Uh, I knew my father couldn't afford to send me to college. And so I had it a little bit on the back burner in my mind. Uh, but she insisted, and but she did more than insist. She um, talked Dillard into giving me a scholarship because that's where she had gone to college. And, um, and so I went off to Dillard. Uh, and I think had it not been for her intercession, I don't see that I actually would have gone to college because most of the people that I knew didn't go to college. Uh, and, um, and so uh, she had an incredible impact on me. But more than that, she was a family member because she remained um, 
in my life until her death um, last year. Mm. She um, moved on to college teaching at uh, Pitt uh, and she ran a theater in Pittsburgh and they're getting ready to name a theater after her in Pittsburgh. Uh, so she was a phenomenal human being and, uh, and so symbolic for me of all the care that teachers take for children in the, um, in the mo most impoverished areas. Uh, they can see beyond the rags, they can see beyond the rough edges and think about a future that we dare not imagine as children. Well, you, uh, I saw a wonderful clip of you at Dillard. Uh, this was two years ago at a Founders Day event, and you were kind of reminiscing with the students. And you said, the, uh, when you arrived at the age of 17 or 18, you described yourself as, as outspoken, opinionated. You said a little <laughs> bit of a troublemaker. But you said, Dillard embraced me and allowed me to grow. Talk about how Dillard shaped you. Well, Mrs. Lilly was very concerned uh, about me um, when I got ready to go to college. Uh, the, the colleges in Texas was, were just integrating, and some of them were not even integrating at that point. And she was very fearful me, for me in that setting because she thought that uh, my, um, uh, my opinionated nature um, and my activist nature would get me into a lot of trouble in a newly integrated environment. And that's why she insisted that I go to a black college because she thought they would have more tolerance for, uh, for that. Um, I think she turned out to be right. I was write, writing pretty fiery editorials in the newspaper. Um, and they were the kinds of um, things that most people at the time really didn't approve of. And so I remember in my freshman uh, composition, I wrote an essay about homosexuality and um, that was an absolute taboo to, to have any, um, any generous thoughts about people who were homosexuals uh, would be horrifying to people, both in the African-American community um, and, and, and otherwise. And I remember writing an editorial about Adam Clayton Powell and his misdeeds. And he was a very popular figure at the time. And I was pointing out some of the things that he was doing that were absolutely wrong. So that was, that was what I was trying to do as a young person. I wanted to, I wanted to reach my own conclusions. Um, I started off by boycotting chapel uh, because uh, I thought it was absurd to insist that all students go to a Protestant ceremony because not all students um, needed to be Protestant. So why would you make a Jewish student or a Muslim student or a Catholic student, why would you force them to go to a Protestant ceremony? And so I boycotted chapel um, and, be, but of course, you know, there were no Jews at Dillard. There were, there were no Muslims at Dillard. It was all parent, right? But it just seemed, I, I was like that as a young person, just the justice issue was so uh, prominent for me. And I wanted to speak out against anything that I thought was um, unjust. Well, you also tell a wonderful story. I think you had a semester or a year at Wellesley um, when you were at, at, at Dillard. And you tell a story about, a, I think, a, a French teacher in which you were, you were struggling in the class. And I think maybe you approached him about taking an incomplete or, or dropping the class dropping. or something. Yeah. And he said no. And, you know, he, and probably in not the most uh, empathetic way. <laughs> and, and the next thing you know, you just sort of headed to the language lab and you just you forced yourself to learn it. And in one of the talks, you said, this was a turning point. You are never again afraid in an academic context because you just kind of took it on. T Absolutely. Tell about how important that was. Well, first of all, imagine um, I'm, you know, uh, I go to this um, professor. Uh, I tell him I'm lost, utterly lost in the class uh, because all these privileged students have been to France and they're fluent in French and they're speaking French in class. And I've just come from Texas and I, I've never been in that environment. So I'm lost. So I go to him and I say, I want to drop the course. And he says, no. I, I, well, first of all, I have to talk about my outrage and my indignation <laughs> about this unfeeling man 
Um, but he didn't give me a choice. And because I didn't have money to drop out of school uh, um, and go home, I didn't have a choice but to stay. And so I, so I said, well, what should I do? He said, just work harder, just work harder. Um, and so I went and I started going to the language lab. And of course, I learned French. Um, and and the, the, um, the, the funny thing about it is that um, French became absolutely the most important thing to me. And I majored in French. Um, and I went to live in France as a Fulbright student. And uh, I got a PhD in French. And I determined that my whole career would be about French. But for that little incident where he told me, you cannot take the easy way out and drop out. You're just going to have to do the work. I never would have. And, but, but it was absolutely true that once I learned that I could apply myself to an intellectual task and overcome my lack of understanding, um, I, it's true, I never was afraid again. I try anything uh, academically. And so uh, that was absolutely a turning point for me. Well, we could talk forever about your, your career in administration, but the one thing that strikes me as kind of an emblematic moment is that you're at Princeton, you're actually a, a French professor there. They approach you about directing the Afro-American program, and understandably, you're miffed. You're saying, that's not my field, you know, why, you know, but then you said, okay, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. And then you gave some, some stringent conditions to be successful, and they met them, and you just... Uh, you effectively turned the program around or, or built it. Yeah, I, I don't know why Princeton put up with me, honestly, because I, you know, imagine um, uh, I, I, coming to me and saying, we'd like for you to do this. And I saying, absolutely not, because you don't respect the program. Uh, if you want someone who is not a specialist in the field to direct it, that tells me you don't care about the problem. So I absolutely will not, will not do that. You see how this strain continues from, from the time I was uh, very young. But, um, but I did realize that although I didn't know anything about the field, I did care about it. And the fact that I cared about it meant that even if I was not expert, I was going to work pretty hard at it and probably harder than the average person will work on it. And so I started by thinking, how can I get Princeton to respect this field? So I sat down with a colleague and I came up with a list of outstanding individuals to try to recruit to Princeton. Because I thought seeing that example would speak volumes to what they needed to understand about the capacity of African-Americans. And so top of my list was Tony Morrison. And so um, somehow uh, we managed to uh, appoint uh, Tony Morrison. And, um, and that really started things uh, flowing. Uh, and a lot of very uh, notable scholars came along after, after Tony Morrison. Uh, so it was a very satisfying thing to do, although it was not you know, really in my wheelhouse, uh, so to speak. Um, the lesson of that was that, you know, a lot of us take on challenges that are not what we are trained to do. Uh, but there are certain ingredients uh, when you're trying to do that kind of work that seem to matter more than anything else. A and one is commitment um, and actually caring about it um, and insisting on high quality. And what I wanted to do for that program was to insist that just as astrophysics could be the number one program in the world, um, so could African-American studies be the number one program in the world at Princeton because it was Princeton. And so I, that, that was the, so I was trying to teach a lesson <laughs> and along the way uh, we managed to, to do quite a lot. Well, the other part of the story I love is that apparently Toni Morrison, you know, you are just poised to hire her, and then some search committee says, oh, she has to submit her resume. And, you know, she yeah. understands, it's sort of like asking Einstein to take a math test or something. <laughs> it's like, so you ended up writing her resume for her. And, uh, but I want to read what, uh, what Toni Morrison said about you in the profile of the New York Times. I love that she said, um, 
she is still a, a bit of a miracle as far as I'm concerned. She has an unusual combination of real politics and integrity and this very keen sense of morals, which does not interfere with her generosity and her wide spiritedness. She's extremely creative in solving other people's problems, and she's a lot of fun. Wow, I don't think I, I don't think I'm familiar with that. So thank it was the New, it was the New York Times. I will send it to you afterwards. Okay, please, please do. Well, the thing is, here, here's so much of what we do is all about um, rules. Um, and um, I, I always tell the people that I hire um, that I don't hire them because um, they are able to follow rules. I hire them because they have good judgment. And so I like to, I like to stress that for leaders especially. So when it came to down to the fact that the committee said, well, no, I mean, we couldn't possibly, we couldn't possibly do this unless, um, you know, she files these papers. You'd really let that stop you from hiring the, the greatest African-American writer in history. You would actually let that happen. So I thought to myself, no, I don't think so. So I went up to my office. I called her assistant. She was at Albany. Um, SUNY Albany, and I said, I want you to read to me the principal elements of her uh, resume. And as she read, I typed, and I typed up the resume and I submitted it. And I, I, I think Tony didn't realize at the time when she got the offer that that had actually happened. I think she may have thought that they actually came to her without her submitting anything. So that was fun. <laughs> well, let's talk about the role of a university president. You have done it, you know, at Smith, at Brown, and now at Prairie View. And it's so interesting because um, a lot of people who've been very, very successful in other realms have not cracked the code about becoming a, a university or college president. I mean, it's been described as one of the toughest jobs uh, in the world. Um, tell me about what you think the key is to be successful. I mean, what does it take to be uh, a transformational leader in the in the educational world. Well, I think you certainly have to believe in what you do. I mean, I, I uh, I'm I'm here because I believe in the power of education, and nobody can convince me that um, that it is anything less than uh, um, transformative. Nobody can convince. So so that is the thing that guides me in everything that I. Do. And that means that when I'm thinking about students. Uh, what I'm thinking about faculty, what I'm thinking about staff, I'm I'm thinking about the role we're playing in um, uh, in making that happen for uh, for for students. So uh, that's just one that's one element of it. You know, people can spot a phony. Uh, you know, we ought to know that by now. And if you do not, if you get up and you say things that you don't believe in, uh, somebody is going to find out. Particularly today. Um, somebody's going to find out. So I try never to say things that I don't mean. Uh, I don't have one message for one venue and a different message for another uh, message. All of, all of what I do has to be integrated. And so when people look back at my time at Princeton, which is very different from Prairie View, and they look at my time at Prairie View, they should not be able to see that I was two different people. I've always upheld the same um, things throughout my career. And I think it's very important in leadership period, whether it's a college presidency or anything else, it's always important to uphold um, the values you have. And when you have to fight for them, um, then you fight for them. And when you have to say no to people, um, uh, you have to be able to explain where that no comes from. And I've had to do that many times in my roles uh, everywhere is to say, uh, no, I cannot stand for that because here is what I believe. Uh, this is what I've represented all of my life. I cannot turn back now just because you want me to do it. So I think that's um, so transparency, um, ethics, uh, candor, uh, communicating well, uh, all of those things are important. Um, uh, but uh, above all of that, it's a deep understanding of what a university is. What does it do for society? 
what does it do for students? What does it do for knowledge? And if you believe in that, um, you have to represent that. I was recently reading an essay that Bob Gates wrote on leadership, and he was uh, the, the part that was most interesting. He was reflecting on it. I think he taught. He was a president of Texas A and M for four years, and he was talking about just the leadership challenges. And one thing that he said is that apparently his predecessor had this twelve or thirteen point agenda, and he said big institutions cannot do that many things. And he 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 narrowed it down to four. He said he, he set very specific deadlines, very tight deadlines. And uh, the phrase I, I, that jumped out at me, he was talking about the importance of implementation. And he says, that's where good intentions too often die, the failure to implement. Does that resonate with you, those kind of basic elements of? of- Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I think that um, uh, my mantra uh, typically to, to many people when they present uh, things to me, uh, I say less is more. Um, we are inclined to throw a lot of things into the soup uh, pot, okay? Um, and most of, most of what we value and most of what gets done is amazingly elegant uh, if, if it's done well. Um, and that means it's, it's, it's simpler. Then, um, then we are naturally inclined to, to make it. And so, uh, so what I spend a lot of time as president doing is pruning back. People come and they say, well, we could do all of these things. And then I say, uh, yes, we could do all of those things in about a hundred years. So let's see what is most important. Let's see how we can prioritize. And more importantly, let's see what's going to add the greatest value to what we're doing over time. And those two factors people often don't consider. Um, The universities are long lived. We have 800 um, or more uh, old universities. Um, We survive a long time. Uh, And so we should be thinking about what will happen um, a decade from now. And how does this fit into the picture? rather than let's do this for the next few years. So, so I think um, that kind of uh, strategy is, is appropriate. I know, I know Bob, we're friends. And so I, I know he's thinking on these things and we are, we are aligned in that respect. Well, let's talk about Prairie View. Um, it was established in 1876, I believe, the second oldest public university um, in Texas, about 9,000 students. Among other things, I think one of your brothers went there on a basketball scholarship, a very yes. famous team back in the late 50s and early 60s. But tell us about Prairie View. And, and I have to say, I, in your inaugural speech, you said, I believe in a way that my path to Prairie, Prairie View was written in the heavens for el- how else can I explain the improbable way I came to this task? Yeah. So tell true. us about Prairie View and your, your journey there. Well, I mean, think of it. I um, Fifth Ward is, uh, at the time I, I was growing up, uh, a very underserved community uh, in the shadow of downtown Houston. Um, and uh, we have basically nothing, right? Um, and so I go from, um, from what is, you know, a shack in Fifth Ward, and I take this very circuitous route. Um, through the world, really, um, live in France for a while, I go to Mexico to live with a family, I uh, go to uh, these great institutions, I learn a lot from being at the best of all possible places, and then I come to Prairie View. So I must have been doing all of that in preparation for this institution, right? That's sort of the way that I see it, because uh, here I am back at home, um, and um, Prairie View uh, is an important institution in Houston, uh, in the Houston area and in Texas, and uh, they needed um, exactly the same thing that Princeton needed. They needed the same thing that Smith and Brown needed. And so why wouldn't I try to bring that to Prairie View? So that's how I ended up staying beyond my initial um, uh, agreement is because I thought hard about all of that experience that I came and how it would go to waste in a sense if I didn't apply it 
to this place closest to where I grew up and closest to um, where all those teachers helped me. And now it was my turn to do that for the students here for a year. Well, you, you, as you mentioned, you initially started as an interim, and uh, and I guess an interview I read where that at a certain point it became clear that there was only so much you could do as an yeah. interim, and there was I, I seen I've seen a, a picture of the text you sent to the chancellor of the Texas A and M system, basically saying. Um, what will it take to, to, to remove interim? And within a half an hour, he <laughs> sent a response saying, can do it, you know, simply, I think was this yeah. one word I answer. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, so at that point, you, you're, you are all in, or you are all in, in terms of, of transforming um, the university. And, and I want to shift to, I mean, you'd been there just a couple of years when the, you know, the tragic murder of, of, of George Floyd and you wrote a statement to the students and the community, which is, I would, to our listeners, I would recommend reading. It's one of the most powerful things I've read in a long, long time. And I, Dr. Simmons, I want to read a couple sentences and just kind of have you um, elaborate. You say, I write to you today out of a profound sense of apprehension about what the future could hold for our students, our community, and our nation. I know that as an educational leader, I'm expected to demonstrate hopefulness at all times, but the events of the last days have moved and dismayed me in unexpected ways. At watershed moments like this, I've concluded that it's better to be forthright, for how else are we to advance the cause of truth and justice if we fail to be honest with ourselves? I wanna to offer today what my, my reflection about these events and my past experience tell me um, we should do in these circumstances. So talk about this letter to the community and then particularly the agenda that followed, because you said we have to go beyond being angry and frustrated. We have to see what we can do to change things. Yeah, I, that was, uh, well, it was of course a, um, a, a difficult moment and these moments continue in our country. And so as I've seen what, transpired since then, uh, I'm, I feel more relieved that we have taken the measures that we took at the time, because this is a long-term project to heal, uh, at, to heal our country and to provide a path forward for, uh, for young people. Uh, we have got to take this seriously and do the hard work, right? Um, and so I wanted to establish something um, of permanence, not just to be out demonstrating about the tragedy, but what can we do that will be lasting? And so we set up the Center for uh, Race and Justice at the university um, and very quickly um, received a gift uh, to support it. Um, we also, and, and that uh, center was to, was to focus on these issues, um, working with police departments, um, providing insights to, uh, to uh, civic institutions and to the legislature. Well, in fact, our first project was for the center was at the behest of the, um, uh, the Black Caucus in the Texas State Legislature asking uh, us um, to create a team of scholars who could advise them on of the way forward. What could they do as legislators that would address these issues and so forth. So, so that, that, uh, so we set that up um, uh, right away and that has continued to grow. Uh, uh, the amount of attention it has gotten and the, frankly, the amount of support that it has received um, has been quite phenomenal. Uh, and I think it's that hunger that people have for real solutions. I often say when it comes to addressing the racial issues in the country, that, you know, one thing I know because of my age is that I could, I could put myself back when I was seven years old and actually it wouldn't be a huge difference in terms of some of the things that are occurring today. Um, and so that tells us how wrong we have been to presume that there are easy solutions. Uh, we have to work at this every day um, and we have to try to keep getting getting better um, at, um, at race relations, especially uh, in this country. Uh, one of the things that I um, 
that I realized uh, that was so good about the South in a way is that um, we lived, although um, the South was quite segregated, uh, we had to work with whites. And we learned how to do that in the midst of conflict, right? Um, uh, what I fear most for the country now is we are moving away from the model of working alongside and with people that we disagree with. Um, and that's a very dangerous path that we're on. So I'm hoping that universities uh, can be uh, intermediaries uh, in terms of showing, um, uh, the, showing organizations, showing governments, uh, showing others how to work uh, with difference of opinion, difference of uh, background, difference of race and ethnicity and religion. Somehow we've got to try to do that. And one of the components of this, as I understand it, is an activist in residence. Tell us about uh, that initiative. Well, I think people are so confused about um, how, what to do in moments uh, of um, distress uh, or moments of breakage. Um, and so people often feel immobilized by that. Um, this actually is an old idea. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was at Smith, um, Gloria Steinem and I talked about the idea of having an activist in residence at Smith because of all of the fine work that so many women who went to Smith did um, in order to uh, improve the, um, the, the rights of women. Um, and so one of the things that we don't do very well on college campuses is give our students a way of understanding how they can have an impact um, on society, uh, but doing it in a way that uh, allows them to understand there are peace, peaceful, um, uh, uh, very um, well-organized uh, ways that people who have come before you have undertaken to change society. And you can do that too. So we wanted to bring through a series of different types of activists who have had an impact on uh, society because they have focused on action and how to get change um, uh, enacted. And I think that's a very important dimension of, of education. I'd like to see us do more around that. Well, you've said, uh, we were, you were mentioning earlier about the role of universities. And one of the things you've said a lot is that the universities need to tell the truth. And I think, uh, and I want to read one quote. This was actually from your Brown days when you had inaugurated a, an examination of the school's uh, connection to slavery. And you said, universities must tell the truth. Other institutions are not tied as closely to transparency and veracity because it's not their trad tradition, legacy, or expectation. To hold on to the trust of the public and sometimes to even earn it or reclaim it universities have to be associated with this kind of disclosure. When they fail to do that, they become just another corrupt institution that should be challenged in every dimension of its enterprise. It does not simply pertain to slavery, it pertains to everything. Everything, everything. And so, you know, we talk a lot about transparency in universities, but we are fond of telling the stories that we want to tell rather than the stories that we must tell. And as I maintain, I think that to me, it is so important at the moment when um, people are so um, leery uh, of public uh, officials, so leery of public statements even, so leery um, of, uh, of, of any um, uh, notion that people are telling the truth uh, what if universities fall into that trap and are no longer the sites for reason, the sites for the discovery of, of important new uh, breakthroughs and knowledge and so forth? I, to me, uh, uh, truth is a part and parcel of what we do in universities. And so we say, we say no when people ask us to lie. We say no when people uh, ask us to change the the results of a study because it will sound better. We say no when people ask us to change the results of scientific experiments. Uh, and we punish people for even um, attempting to do that kind of thing. We say no when somebody lies about whether or not they have a certain credential. 
Um, and so we are we are the we are the guardians of trees in a way. Um, and uh, on every uh, on every barometer, really, uh, universities have to represent that. And so do the people who inhabit the university. And that starts with the boards of trustees um, and the presidents and the leadership of universities. Well, let's talk for a minute or two about the importance of historically black colleges and universities. And I was in preparing for this interview, I was reading an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education about their history and their reach. And I came across some astonishing numbers. They, they said there's now about 107 private and public. Um, and they say that these institutions have produced 80 percent of all black judges, 50 percent of all black lawyers, 50 percent of all black doctors. 40% of all black engineers and 40% of all black members of Congress. I mean, that's a pretty astonishing reach into American life, isn't it? It, it is. And, and um, they definitely outperform um, in terms of their, um, their uh, assets, let's say, and their, their, their position in society. They should have received much more support over time uh, than they have. Uh, but but think about it. Think about it this way. Um, I often say I say this for any of my students, whether at Princeton or Brown or any place, that in order for them to learn and to accomplish what they need to accomplish as human beings, the first thing for them to do is to feel um, safe and respected. Um, it's like that moment when I discovered that I could in fact speak French and I could understand a foreign language. And that sense of confidence that grew from that experience where I understood what I could do. Well, in some ways, HBCUs are in the business of showing students who may be encountering, they may go to a mall, they may go to a job society, uh, and they may discover that people are, um, uh, debasing them, that people are doubting them, that people are suggesting that they're not very good and so forth. All of the things that, you know, obviously people like, like me experienced in my, in my childhood. And then suddenly you go to a place and, what, and they hold you to a higher standard. They don't allow you to feel sorry for yourself. They say, you, they do what this French professor did for me. They say, no, you can do it. And here's what you're going to have to do or, or the way that I treat my students, you know, they come in to see me and, and they are slouching or they're dressed poorly or, or uh, they don't stand up when, you know, they, they say hello or something and I give them back uh, for that uh, because uh, they need to understand that, that, that they, can, they can be a certain way with their friends but there is a there are social norms that exist outside of their small world where they are enjoying themselves with their friends, and so that's what that's what these colleges do for them. And so you can become a judge, you can become a, a vice president of the United States because somebody has had the metal to tell you that's not the way to get ahead. You have to do this, and so, so that's that's the value of these colleges. It's more than the courses. It's more than um, having the right equipment. It's the people who are there to tell you things that otherwise you might not ever hear. Well, when you're looking out the window of your office, do you sometimes see yourself and the students walking by? And, and <laughs> tell us about that experience. Of just <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, that's what convinced me to come in the first place. I looked and I saw students and I thought, oh, that's, there I go, you know, at their age, and especially the misbehaving ones, you know. I, I'm very partial to them because um, I'm so accustomed to people thinking that young people who are different or outspoken or insistent on uh, certain values and so forth, um, I, I'm very accustomed to those students being punished. And so I, I, I like to defend those students, uh, not for what they are today, but for what they are likely to become. Because, um, because inherent in what they're doing 
um, are the values that will take them far. And the people ask me often, how did I survive all of that? So how, how did I survive Harvard? How did I survive Princeton? At a time when it was very difficult for African-Americans. Um, and I, you know, and I, I, I always tell them because there was something in me that didn't need that approbation. Um, and because I didn't need it, I could keep going. So the students need to find their way to that inner uh, strength and that approbation um, that, uh, that will really um, make them very secure in their positions going forward. And, and that's, that's incredibly valuable to me. You know, I've known some extraordinary uh, individuals who have been, uh, who weathered uh, uh, really extraordinary things in their lives, and yet they've held steady and they've succeeded. And, they, and, and, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to see, but always there's somebody who's had their arm around them who helped them get there. And so I, um, I used to go to the dining hall at Brown and stand in the, in the dining hall or in the student center. Uh, I'd go in a corner and the students would come and line up in front of me and I would hug them one by one. I've always felt that that approbation, that approval, that um, it is so vital to students because they're still young people trying to understand what they can do in life. And if you give them that assurance that they matter uh, and that they are capable, there are incredible things that they can do. Well, I guess that leads to the question I was going to ask about what is the, 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 the best part of being a college president and what's the most challenging? What is the part of the job that's really, really hard? <laughs> I guess... I, mm, that's a tough thing for me because, you know, I don't see it as being that bad uh, as, as a job. Uh, I enjoy it immensely. It, it has many moving parts, it's true. Um, but because I do it on my own terms, it's not that difficult for me. So you get a lot of people who um, are um, a bit solipsistic. Um, and they want this and they want that and they may not be thinking about the whole, um, the job of a college president is to think about the whole of the university. Um, the job of uh, a faculty member is to think about their field and what they want. Um, the job of the student is to think about what they would like to have and so forth. The job of the university president is not everybody at the same time. And so I, I regard the, the biggest part of my job is trying to help people understand that that's what I represent. Uh, I don't represent um, uh, somebody who will do their bidding. Um, I don't represent somebody who um, is, is here just to prop up their ideas. That my, my task is really to think about the health of the university and to think about its future and to do the things, the combination of things that will make it stronger over time. And so, so that's, that's, that's probably the hardest thing is communicating that. Um, uh, but but um, honestly, I think people get that. And so it, it's, it may not be that hard. Uh, that may not be that hard to actually do. What was the second part of your question? Well, just, I mean, what you like the most, and, I, and I, I'm just oh, gathering. what I like the most. Uh, this is, well, getting to know the students and interacting with them. Um, I'll tell you, when I was at Smith um, and Brown came to me and asked me to consider becoming president of Brown, I said no, that I, I was committed to Smith. Uh, but then somebody came to me and said, um, think of it this way. Uh, think of your capacity to influence a large number of students over the time of your presidency. So if you are um, at uh, Brown for 10 years, and I was there for 11, uh, think of the students you will influence over that period of time and in ways that you can never know. And ultimately that's, that's what I thought was important to do. If I, could, if I could do that, if I could reach enough people who then in turn could reach other people, um, then that, that would be pretty good to do. So, um, 
So I enjoy the fact that I know there are students that I will actually never meet from Smith, from Princeton, from Brown, from Prairie View, who for one reason or the other will carry the message that I try to impart to them to hundreds of other people. Uh, and so to me, uh, I enjoy the, the power of, uh, of thinking about the possibility of influencing the direction of the country by influencing people who go on to do important things in their lives. And I, of course, I hear from students all the time from these institutions who say, well, you didn't know me. I was a student when you were there and this is what I'm now doing. And typically when they're doing something that they think I will like, they come back and they tell me, which is wonderful. We had a question emailed in from a gentleman from Chicago, Bill, who wanted to know about just athletics in, in, in the university and how, I mean, that we could talk about that for an hour, but how do you see that um, um, as, um, as affecting your job? I mean, what finding the, the correct balance, um, um, reaching out to alumni who probably are very invested in <laughs> athletics, <Yes. laughs> maybe more than the students are, if I could be honest. So what, what is your, what is your, your, your just sort of broad thoughts on athletics and, and the college experience? Well, I, um, I, I guess the thing that is important to remember is that um, uh, athletics is a cultural phenomenon in American universities um, in a way that it is not in other universities around the world. Okay, so, so for wh whatever reason, we have married athletics with the university experience. And, and the, there comes with um, the university experience the expectation of athletic competition. Um, uh, I, don't think, um, I don't think we can ever change it at this juncture because that, that's, that's what is, has become embedded in the culture of uh, university. Uh, is it difficult to deal with? Uh, yes, because um, uh, high profile athletics, especially, comes with all kinds of things like highly compensated um, uh, coaches, um, uh, uh, athletes who are uh, high profile and who uh, wish to be treated that way, um, uh, supporters of athletics who are for whatever reason, more interested in athletics than they are in the uh, in the academics uh, of the of the university. So, what I I sort of regard my role as president to be um, continuously informing people about uh, about the balance and about the centrality of the academic experience uh, at a university. There are many things we do in addition to. The we have music, uh, we have performances, uh, we have an entrepreneur's club, we have all kinds of things, but they don't supersede the value of what we do fundamentally in, um, in scholarship and, and research. And so that's, what, that's, what I, that's the way I think about it. It's something that we, uh, that we have that is very enjoyable. I enjoy uh, athletics, I'm going to competitions uh, and so forth. But, um, but my first uh, focus is always on uh, the uh, academics of the university. Well, President Simmons, I was, I was looking at a, uh, something on um, Smith's website. It was, called, you know, it was a page on the Simmons years, and it, it laid out your just astonishing uh, contributions, created a poetry center, engineering school, uh, you know, doubled the endowment, did some amazing things. And then one of the final items, someone might have put in a little playfully, it says, so they, they list it year by year. And then on 2001, it says, President Simmons makes a memorable appearance on a scooter in a 2001 Senior Rally Day show. <laughs> what was that all about? Of course, you know, also it's rather that you have to do some very uh, risky things. <laughs> <laughs> First, let me say, I was not an athlete in college. Okay. When I grew up, women didn't do athletics, basically, but, but all the boys in my family did. That's why my brother became a, a, a very uh, accomplished uh, player and, and, a, and, a, and a very winning coach. But, um, but, but that's not, and my parents wouldn't allow us to do it. 
Um, and so, uh, so I, I, I just am no good at that. But in any case, so there are a number of things that stand out. That's one. Uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, I also do things like when in the rugby competition, uh, I put my hands over my eyes uh, and, and so I don't have to look at rugby and so on. And then once at Brown, some lunatic um, told me that the uh, Olympic torch was coming to town and they thought it would be wonderful if the president of Brown ran with the torch. And so, um, uh, and so I agreed. And when I had to run, it was uphill, right? It was, people still talk about how, uh, talk about that and how sad it was that <laughs> I could barely carry that torch uphill during, during the Olympics, um, uh, the lead up to the Olympics. So, so yeah, I, yeah, I try to join in uh, when, when I can with students, uh, but, but I try not to look ridiculous uh, if, if I can avoid it. Well, you know, and it actually connects. We had a wonderful conversation with the dean of Johns Hopkins School of International Studies, Elliot Cohen, who was saying that, you know, at its best, education has sort of a fun, playful component. And, and what you, you, you know, it's important to be serious and focused and disciplined, but it's also important to be able to tap into this other part of your personality and, and show that you can enjoy life. I, I, I think so. I mean, I, I don't have anything against the you know, the very, very serious figures that have led uh, universities that have no pretense whatsoever to uh, being fun. But, uh, but it is, after all, uh, uh, wonderful to be around young people and to know their aspirations and to be able to, to do things that, you know, I mean, I know this because of Mrs. Lilly. Okay, I know that, but for her, my life would have been radically different. I know that. And so I'm very sensitive to the fact that an, an interaction with a young person, no matter who you are, a teacher, um, a, a member of the community who is uh, interacting with them, uh, can have any, make an enormous difference for them. So I treat all of those interactions very seriously, and which means I want to be, a, first of all, approachable. Uh, any student can write to me. Any student can come to see me. Um, any student uh, knows that if they have a problem, they can, there are lots of places they can go, but they can also come to me, and, and they do. So to me, that, that's all important, that students feel validated in that way. And I don't just say students. I, I say to students, respect everybody. Respect the person who's cleaning the floor in your building. Um, because I think that's what we need to do more of uh, in our country is to have a sense of how we conduct ourselves with our fellow citizens and others. Um, we have a way of uh, interacting that can solve a lot of the problems that we have. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I live in a state where um, there are so many uh, violent incidents uh, uh, between people who don't know each other. Um, uh, because of a word, um, because of a glance, because of some interaction that is uh, frankly insignificant. Um, uh, and so we've got to do what we can to make sure that we're modeling the kind of behavior that brings people together rather than pushes them uh, apart. Right. Well, Dr. Simmons, you've been amazingly gracious with your time and, and, and sharing your life experiences. Um, we will continue to follow your work. And when COVID eases, and if you're traveling in the Midwest, we would love to coax you to Southern Illinois University and talk to students. I think you'll, you'll see some of the same kinds of students here as you do at, uh, at Prairie View. So we'd love to host you and meet with people in the community and all. So it thank you so much pleasure. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being with you. Great. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We will have a video of this interview on our website tomorrow. So please look at it, share it with family and friends, and let everyone know the great work that uh, Dr. Simmons is doing and continue to follow her. Thank you so much. And thank you for keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well.